with his own hands. <laughs> right, it is really good to be here tonight. It really is. I didn't think we are going to make it. Uh, I don't know how long y'all been out here, but I've been hearing rumors. Uh, it seems like about 25 minutes ago we were riding through Paris, Texas. And, uh, you know, I, we went to Uncle Brian and Aunt Jean's house and we picked up Uncle Brian's tank. And, uh, or he calls it a Dodge. But, uh, and then we, uh, we headed over here, and I ain't ever seen so many red and blue lights in my life in Merritt, Texas. Yeah. Golly! Yeah. I'll tell you what. Hey, look, I, I want to I wanna start off by saying something. Um, I, I wrote this, uh, really, it's, you know, I guess you call it a speech, you call it whatever. Uh, but I wrote this several months ago, uh, whenever, uh, well, a couple of years ago, whenever President Trump got elected. And the reason why I did that is because uh, I knew that when we had a uh, president like President Trump get elected, that I was not going to stay where I was. Right. And, yeah. Now, you might complain that it took a little while, but uh, he's kind of fighting an uphill battle. Yep. So what I want to do is I want to start off today by talking about the commander in chief. Now, as an army officer, as a soldier, uh, we're not allowed to be partisan. We're not allowed to say uh, in uniform whether we're Republican or Democrat. So I'm not going to do that. Um, but you know, I think it's wholly appropriate to stand up here and thank the man who put me here uh, and who had the uh, intestinal fortitude to do the right thing. And so I'm going to do that. Uh, now, you know, my lawyers, uh, <laughs> there's a bunch of them, they're awesome. Uh, they want me to tell you something, and that's that uh, I'm not partisan. I'm just up here to thank the man, all right? So with that being said, um, I'd like to start with a personal message to President Donald Trump, the commander in chief of the world's greatest military, bar none. Mr. Uh -oh. President. Absolutely. Mr. President, today you have shown the men and women of the world's greatest military something important. I'd like to share some observations of mine of the Commander-in-Chief from a soldier's perspective. The President bears a heavy burden, the burden of command as we call it in the military. The Commander-in-Chief has to order thousands of America's young troops, many of them from communities just like this one, into the valley of the shadow of death every single day. American troops fight on today's battlefields with our enemies all around us. They do not wear uniforms. They do not fight in armored combat vehicles or helicopters. These people are expert at blending in and looking like a good guy just after they've killed a bunch of innocent people. Terrible. That's who we're fighting. That's what we're fighting. Americans are faced with impossible tasks. Who is with us? Who is with us? And who is against us? It is all pretty doggone impossible. But impossible just happens to be what the world's greatest military does best. American soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen, and soon to be Space Force crewmen, make it happen every single day, and we always will. And it's because we come from places like this. And that's why. <coughs> Mr. President, it is clear that you understand this. And today, you have sent a clear signal to our great military that you do. We finally have a commander in chief that understands our mission. Trump 2020. <laughs> and we finally have a president that understands that when America sends our troops to fight impossible wars, we must stand behind them. Amen. 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 Yep. Amen is right. Our troops can now go into battle and know that our own government finally has their back. Whoa. 
It's been a long time coming. Yep. Yes, it is. A soldier who knows his commanders love him will kick down the doors of hell for his country, for this country. Our soldiers must know that their commanders love them. And today, Mr. President, they know that again. For that, Mr. President, and so much more, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. You will always have this soldier's love and loyalty. I'd like to ask you all to give the President a hand, please. I appreciate that. And I know uh, the Commander-in-Chief appreciates that. Okay, and now to those of us who are not the leader of the free world. Uh, it took us a long time to get here. Yes. Yeah, it sure did. Uh, didn't think it'd ever come. Uh, just briefly, I'd like to talk about that journey. Uh, most days spent in prison are very dark. Kind of like this. Well, it wasn't supposed to be dark when we got here. <laughs> Turns out Kansas and Oklahoma were pretty far away. Uh, they're very dark in prison. But every once in a while, a ray of light comes through. And for me, and a couple of my battle buddies, as we call each other in the Army, it arrived in a mail bag that said U.S. Mail every single day. You know, in over six years in prison, there were maybe a dozen mail calls, or work days, where I did not get a piece of mail from one of you. Think about that. In six years, a dozen days with no mail. A dozen days with no ray of light in six years. That's incredible. That's more Bloody than incredible. Clint. You gave me strength to go on. So to my American family, thank you. You never gave up and you never gave in. Amen. Please give each other a hand. You know, I got mail from some of the weirdest places, too. Uh, Northern Mariana Islands, who knew it, you know. Uh, Guam, of course Hawaii, there's a lot of military folks out there. Nice place to retire. Uh, all over the place, all 50 states, Puerto Rico, uh, England, United Kingdom, uh, Scotland, uh, Australia, how many marriage Cyprus. proposals? Say again? How many marriage proposals? <laughs> uh, not a lot, thankfully. <laughs> thankfully. Uh, all over the world, uh, people would send me letters of support. And it wasn't because I'm some awesome guy. It's because American soldiers lead. Americans lead in this world. And anywhere you go in the world, when you see the red, white, and blue, like that beautiful, I mean, it's everywhere out here. It's just, it's, it's gorgeous, right? When you see that red, white, and blue, if you're a bad guy, you're getting scared and you're probably gonna go the other way. But if you're a good guy, you're feeling right at home. And that's what world we own right now. Now, that's something that we can all be proud of. And, uh, you know, our, our state, Texas is, it's pretty patriotic. Uh, it doesn't hold a candle to Louisiana, by the way. Uh, just gotta say it, uh, it just doesn't. Uh, but it's pretty patriotic. And uh, we send a lot of people into the army. I'd, I'd say when I served in the army uh, for most of my time, uh, most of the people I met uh, that came from one state or another would come from Texas. There's a lot of folks in Texas that go in the army, in the military. So. We have a lot to be thankful for in this state, in this country, and that's the men and women who will continue to put their life on the line for not just for communities like this, and not just for uh, you know this awesome country, uh, but for people around the world that have no hope and they've got nobody else to look out for them. 
So now I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about, I talked about my American family. I talked about my Hunt County family. Uh, I talked about, uh, you know, folks around the world and so on and so forth, my military family. Now I want to talk about my own family. Uh, and this is something that's, you know, admittedly, it's very near and dear to my heart. It should be. You know, when I went to prison, uh, I had to take another look at my compass. Admittedly, I was locked way off course, but not my family. Or, I mean, if they were, they didn't show it. Uh, they didn't miss a beat. You might remember them having community garage sales around here, bake sales, golf tournaments. They meant to raise money for my legal fees, but instead they raised an army. My family has actually gotten a lot bigger over these six years. Every visit, every phone call gave me hope. I'm looking at you, Mama. We love you, Mama! Where's Aunt Jean at? Where's Jamie at? Jamie's right here. All right. I'm looking at all yous. Look. It gave me hope. It kept me going. It recharged my batteries. My light never ran out because of you, my family. And here's something incredible. And I think it's incredible because uh, nobody else had this in the prison that I was in. Uh, for six straight years, my mom and dad, who are not the wealthiest people in the world, you know, we're from Lock County. Uh, it's just the way it is. <laughs> yeah, we're all one big old family. Uh, for six straight years, my mom and dad drove to Kansas on Highway 69 to spend Christmas and New Year's with me in prison. They'd stay there for a couple weeks. Six straight years. Amen. And you know that's that's pretty cool, right? But that's not it. That's not that's not all of it that my awesome family did. Uh, I think that's pretty awesome. But and Gene and Uncle Brian came up during the summer, spent their summer vacation with me in prison. That's awesome. That's huge. That is. Amen. You're right. That is awesome. That that is huge. That is amen. You see? Yeah. Give my family a hand. Will you? Thank you. Y'all deserve it. Y'all deserve it. I tell you what, some good people in this in this county right here. It's the sound is awesome. You know, a big part of being in prison is feeling like you're alone. But I was never alone. Not one day. Um, I was never excluded from my family, from my community. And that right there is enough to keep you going. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You see, that's not normal for a prisoner, even in the military prison, which, you know, if you don't know, the military prison is a, uh, a lot more strict place than a normal prison. Uh, it's actually called the United States Disciplinary Barracks, and for good reason. Uh, very strict place. It's like uh, being in basic training the whole time you're in prison. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, it is what it is. It's just how things are. Uh, but sadly, most prisoners there never see their family at all. And wow. so to my amazing and extraordinary family, thank you. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please help the others. Absolutely. Get out. Get out. Absolutely. Somebody just uh, said, uh, please help the others get out. And we, that is definitely something that the good Colonel here, uh, Colonel, Gerfine, by the way, Bull Gerfine uh, of United American Patriots. I was going to introduce him later, but that gives me the opportunity. Um, his organization and our organization now, because I'm going to be a part of it forever as long as I have breath in my body. Uh, Amen. That's what they do. Uh, they exist to find wrongs that are committed against our service members service members that go overseas and fight for our country and then come back here to 
overzealous prosecutions. And, and look, I, I gotta explain this real quick. All right, uh, you got two different militaries. I'm kind of going off script and I apologize. I just, it's just what I do. Uh, so you got two different militaries. You got the military in DC, in the Pentagon, that wears a lot of brass on their collars and their shoulders. Uh, the generals, the colonels, no offense, sir. Uh, all of those guys and gals, uh, they're a different military, uh, especially the generals and the admirals. Uh, once you get to that level, you're a politician. And, you know, I always used to tell people, you know, once you have to get your promotion signed off on by the Senate, you're definitely a politician. So those guys, that's, that's what happens with them. So you got that military and that's, that's uh, to me, that's not really the military, that's the politicians that run the thing. And then you got the men and women on the ground where the metal meets the road, where the sparks fly, boots on the ground, in the mud, in the dirt, America's best. Yes. That yes. is the real United States military. Yes. Yeah. 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 Now, we've got some work to do, uh, and we're going in the right direction with this commander in chief. Yeah. And every single day, I see something in the military that this commander in chief is fixing and making right again yes and so you know again soldiers are not allowed to be partisan but i appreciate commander-in-chief look, looking after his soldiers Amen. and after his service members Amen. Amen. and now this is going to be uh a little different uh i want to talk about the men that i left behind in fort leavenworth uh, just briefly let me I think I've got a little bit of time, not to waste all your time, but uh, you got, you got Fort, all the time. You got, you got Fort all the time in the world. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> you got Fort Leavenworth, which is a military installation, and you have Leavenworth, which is a city in Kansas. Uh, so whenever you hear somebody say something like "send them to Leavenworth," that's not really a thing. Uh, you're sending them to Fort Leavenworth, uh, and more specifically, you're sending them to the United States Disciplinary Barracks on Fort Leavenworth. Uh, that place has about 400 to 500 at any given point in time uh, from all the services. Currently, they're all male, uh, and it is almost always full. And, you know, you can't tell me that that many people who are up to no good are joining the United States military. So how does it happen? How does something like what happened to me happen? Cold-hearted people covering their ass. That's that's a good <laughs> explanation. Cold-hearted people. Amen. Here's what it is: the men and women who uh, are in charge of and prosecute these uh, these soldiers, these service members, and put them in prison. Uh, they themselves are members of the military in uniform. And let me say this. The United States military does not lose. And that applies to its lawyers too. If you're wearing this uniform, you don't lose. It's just something you don't do. It's just something you get used to. You, get, you never get tired of winning. But these guys and gals, they have a different mission and their mission is to go after people that do all the hard work. And so they keep the prison at, at Fort Leavenworth full. So I want to talk about those men that I left behind at Fort Leavenworth because I think that, you know, there are certainly some bad guys there, but you can't tell me that there are that many bad folks that join the world's greatest military. I just don't believe it. I just lived with them for six years. I don't believe it. So. You know, as I said, we never go through anything alone. Uh, I'll admit, 
you know, I had some pretty dark days in prison sometimes. I mean, everybody's got bad days here and there. Uh, but my battle buddies kept me going. A game of cards, a workout in the gym, a jog around the track, a conversation about an uncertain future. All of these are reminders that nobody is ever truly alone. And nobody is ever truly lost. Nobody. To be sure, as I said, prison is full of people who have lost everything. But they endure. They wake up every day and just keep going. I admire that about human nature. So to the men I left behind at the DB, and to those in prisons around the country, I want you to know something. You matter. Never give up on yourself. Right. Try to see through your pain. You must keep improving. Keep learning. And none of you who know me will be surprised to hear me say, stay in school and get that degree. Remember who you are. And when you get out and you return to our American family, do not forget the road that you have traveled. Do not forget what you have overcome. I am with you. We are with you. And now I'd like to talk about the brilliant team that made this all happen in terms of uh, getting me on this. What is, what is this? A gooseneck flatbed? Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Okay, hey trailer, all right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's where I belong. All right. Yeah. And I'd like to talk about the uh, the brilliant team that made this all happen behind the scenes. Uh, I introduced uh, the colonel here, Colonel Gerfine, uh, and his great organization, United American Patriots. Uh, and so I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't start off with them because. Uh, let me tell you, do we have time to tell the story about Colonel Gerfine? Depends which one you got okay. to tell. Okay. Right. Okay. I got to tell a story. I, I'm sorry if, you know, it, I know it's cold. But. Go ahead. Go ahead. So here I am sitting You're in Fort Leavenworth. You're home. All right. Here it is yesterday, Friday, sitting in Fort Le It's Friday. It's Saturday, right? Oh, my God, it's been a long time. Long. Golly. All right, so here I am sitting in uh, in Fort Leavenworth, and I'm actually laying there on my bunk, and some guy comes to my room and he says, uh, "Hey, Lawrence, uh, you got a phone call," <laughs> and <laughs> I'm like, "Okay, who's calling me?" You know what I mean? Like, I can't tell you that. So he takes me down to the office of the uh, command judge advocate, which is. You know, most people know as a judge advocate general or the army's lawyers. Uh, and the office is locked, so he has to open it up with his key. And we go in this dark little room, and they have one of those speakerphone things sitting on the on the desk there. And uh, one of the ones that don't have a handset is just kind of sitting there, like kind of useless a little bit. And uh, so anyway, he, you know, it wasn't long before that thing started ringing. He puts the button on it, and uh, there was a, a woman came on, and she said. Uh, she said, this is Colonel so-and-so with uh, the Judge Advocate General of the Army's office, uh, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, and so I started getting nervous. I'm like, oh crap, what'd I do? And you know, the Judge Advocate General, yeah, the Judge Advocate General of the Army's office is, they're up there in the Pentagon. They're those, all those people I was talking about earlier. Uh, so anyway, she says, uh, she says, you have uh, Clint Lawrence there with you? And I'm like, I'm like, me? <laughs> Do I got to talk to this lady? So anyway, uh, the guy says, yeah, he's here. Uh, and she says, okay, uh, hold the line and keep keep this line open. And uh, you're going to hear from somebody, in a, the senior a senior defense official. And so I started getting nervous. I'm like, oh, my gosh, who am I going to talk to? The next thing you know, this real nice lady comes on. And uh, she, she says, uh, 
Oh, Mr. Lawrence? Uh, do I have Mr. Lawrence here? Like, yes, ma'am. Clint Lawrence. And uh, she says, hold for the president. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, say again, over? <laughs> yeah, hold for the president. And so, uh, President Trump, uh, you know, you would think the president would answer the phone in some, you know, kind of royal way or something, Not, you know? Hello? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, this is Lieutenant Clint Lawrence. Well, how you doing, Lieutenant? I'll tell you, you know, there's some people who uh, might get intimidated, you know, just a lowly, uh, even even just a lowly soldier in the army, but I was a freaking prisoner, and the president's calling me, and so it's a little intimidating, you know, so I'm kind of nervous, you know. Well, President Trump could tell that I was nervous, and so he has a way, I don't know how he does it, but he has a way of making you feel comfortable when you talk to him. And he, he does it because he knows you're nervous. He knows that he's the president and you're going to be nervous. Amen. And he wants you to talk to him. And so we had a nine-minute conversation. Uh, yeah, I was timing it. I was. I was sweating and everything else. Golly. The vice president was in the room. Uh, and I'll tell you, you know, those two leaders, those two men care about this country. Amen. Yeah. 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 Woo! Yeah. They do. Bar none. I, it's, it's just, you can't argue with it. And, you know, they took the time out of out of their busy day, and there was, a, there was probably a hundred people in the room with them, and they took the time out of their busy day to talk to me, uh, you know, a lowly peon, and ask me what I was going to do with the rest of my life and tell me, person to person, man to man, that I'm about to grant you a pardon and expunge your record completely. Yeah, imagine that, right? Golly. Well, so we had a, a, a good conversation and I walked away from that conversation knowing that this country is in good hands. Yeah. Yeah. All right, now let me uh, let, let me get back to my notes because if not, I'll just stay up here all night. Uh, all right, so I'd like to talk uh, I'd like to talk about the brilliant team that made this all happen uh, behind the scenes. And you know, a lot of people write to their Congress members and never hear anything back, and never see anything happen because of it. Call them, can't get them online. Email them, don't get a response. Well, I got a list of them here that actually don't do that. These people actually care. And you would think I'd be st starting with the state of Texas, but no. No Ted Cruz on this list. Nope. No John Cornyn on this list. Nope. And what district are we in? We're in the fourth house district of Texas right here. No John Ratcliffe on this list. Nope. Couldn't be bothered. But I'll tell you who could be bothered. The men who the voters of the state of Louisiana hired to go to Congress and represent them. And about a dozen other states here, and I'm about to tell you where. You know, I've got to start with Louisiana because that I, I just can't say enough about that state. They, I can't say enough about the people. I've never lived there. Dad works there every once in a while. Um, I've never spent any time there at all. But when they see something that needs to be fixed, kind of like, you know, if dad is a welder and sees a fence broken or tractor plow broken or whatever, he don't go whining about it. He just fixes it. We don't have enough of that in this country. So I'm going to start with Louisiana. Congressman Garrett 
graves. Senator, let me let me back up for a second. Congressman Garrett Graves, I, uh, the reason why I wanted to have him first is Congressman Graves called my mom from Air Force One, sitting across from President Donald Trump, because President Trump cared about my mom's feelings and said, hey, Congressman, call that soldier's mama and tell her to get ready because our boy is coming home. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is who we have leading our country. And that makes me feel really, really great. And I don't care what anybody says. That's a good man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Congressman Garrett Graves. Congressman Garrett Graves. Senator Bill Cassidy. Congressman Ralph Abraham and Governor, yep, they got the governor. Louisiana did, Texas didn't. But they got the governor, John Bell Edwards. <laughs> and I'll say this, the governor of Louisiana is a Democrat. He may not be after today, because they just had an election. But <laughs> it's not just Republicans that care. It's Americans that care. It's Louisianans, or what I call them, Cajuns. I think that's not just a me thing. I think that's actually a thing. Uh, it's Cajuns that care. Uh, this is going to drive you crazy. We even had one from California. Yeah. Wacko land, right? Yeah. I don't know what he's doing out there. I think he's lost. Yeah. Well, Congressman... Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Congressman Duncan Hunter, uh, he's fought for me since the very, very beginning. And I want to say thank you, Congressman, for standing up. Well, I, I won't say what I truly feel, but, but for standing up at, at a place where it's not you know, usually okay to do that. Uh, and, uh, and being a leader since the very, very beginning. And I appreciate it, Congressman Duncan Hunter of California. Yeah. From Illinois, oh, I ain't done yet. <laughs> Texas is at the bottom of this list. Uh -oh. From Illinois, Congressman Adam Kinzinger, State Senator Michael Hastings, and State Representative Linda Chapa La Villa. I had to say that slow because it's kind of a, you know, tongue twister. From Pennsylvania, Congressman Scott Perry. From Montana, former Congressman and Interior Secretary of the United States, Ryan Zinke. The guy that rode the horse up to the Capitol steps. <laughs> from Florida, where I, I, I think I mentioned I received more letters than from any other state. Just a bunch of patriots in Florida. Congressman Neil Dunn, Congressman Michael Waltz, who just happens to be a retired Lieutenant Colonel Green Beret Special Forces. It's pretty cool. And Governor, yep, another Governor, Ron DeSantis. From Arizona, Congressman Paul Gozar, who I think is a dentist by trade, and Congressman former Congressman Matt Salmon from the great state of Georgia Congressman Jody Heiss Congressman Ralph Norman of South Carolina who actually took the time out of his day out of his week believe this or not to visit me in prison yeah walked in one day and there was three congressmen sitting there you hey you want to see some prison guards freak out <laughs> Let some United States congressmen walk through the door. Yep, that was a cool day. None of them were from Texas. Actually, one of them was from Texas. I'll, I'll take that back. If you're, if you're sensing here that I have a little bit of animosity toward our congressman, you might be right. There's too many patriots in Texas That's right. for that to be the case. From Arizona, 
Congressman Paul Gozar, I think I just said that, and Matt Salmon. And finally, from the Lone Star State, Congressman Louis Gomert, Congressman Brian Babin, and Congressman Bill Flores. Now, we have a recent transplant to the Lone Star State from Florida. Of course he would come from Florida because that's where all the Patriots are. That's where all the awesome people are. And Colonel Allen West, has anybody ever heard of him? Oh yeah. Okay, yeah, he's freaking awesome. He, uh, you know, Colonel West actually checked on me when I was in prison uh, every month. He had somebody come and visit me in prison and then send him a report. I think that's pretty cool. Colonel West is now a Texan, and he's now running for the chair of the Texas Republican Party. That's all I'll say about that. Texas is, is uh, lucky to have a man like the Colonel. So now, you know, you don't get anything like this done I've come to understand without uh, a lot of folks embarrassing a lot of people with a lot of power. Uh, and thankfully in this case, th those people were all those generals and admirals I was talking about earlier. And they, as it turns out, they don't like it when the media gets a hold of something that they've been doing that's dirty. They don't like that at all. <clears throat> so I'd like to and you'll probably, hopefully, see me on uh, Fox News tomorrow and maybe the day after because I owe these guys and gals yes, because sir. they uh, are very instrumental in getting me out. Woo! And so we, we've got, you know, I never thought that, I, that I, anybody would actually care about me enough to want to interview me, but they, we, we've got a lot of ABC, CNN types that are asking for interviews, but me and Jamie, my twin, where's Jamie? Jamie's here somewhere. All right, me and Jamie, we're gonna go off to New York City. Oh, I see you back there. We're gonna go off to New York City uh, tomorrow and we're gonna be wearing our red hats. Uh, and, and we're gonna sit down uh, with Pete Hegseth, Fox News. Sean Hannity, Fox News. All those amazing people, Ed Henry, Fox News. Now we're not gonna sit down with Brian Kilmeade, that would just be too much in one day, <laughs> or one couple of days, but uh, it would be an honor. But uh, Brian Kilmeade is actually uh, another one that, uh, actually when the president was talking to me yesterday, uh, he told me who all got me out of prison. And he gave me a list and I was trying to keep up, but he talks really fast. And uh, I looked over and the guy that, the, the prison guard that was in there with me was just kind of stared at me like, you're talking to the president. <laughs> and so I didn't even try to write it down. Well, uh, it's important to me to thank these people in the media uh, because they're the ones that made those generals and admirals who are part of what some people call the deep state, uh, who are part of this. They just, they've just been doing it too long. When you throw a camera in, in front of somebody, uh, somebody like that, um, it tends to make them do the right thing. And so I think Fox News, who from the very, very beginning has been doing everything they can, even when we had a different president, to get me out of prison. Now. Fox News sent an investigator, uh, they're the only ones that have ever done this, sent an investigator to Fort Leavenworth to sit down with me and do their own investigation and interview me. They wanted to know what was what. Why in the world is this happening? And that means a lot because nobody else did that. All these big fancy folks around here Nobody else did that. And so 
me and Jamie, we're going to go to New York City tomorrow, and we're going to tell them thank you. And uh, you know, don't worry, they're paying for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're going to tell them thank you, and uh, and we're going to sit down and and uh, and and tell the American people that that we appreciate what they did um, supporting President Trump and Vice President Pence. Uh, and by the way, Vice President Pence uh, talked almost as much as President Trump did, and that was because President Trump kept on making him talk. Uh, yeah, and so the Vice President, uh, he's, as you know, he's a, a very, uh, I, obviously I'm not gonna talk like I know the man, I just talked to him once, but uh, he, he came off to me as someone who deeply loves the military, um, maybe more than uh, than others, and I appreciate that. And he's very disciplined, and, and every single time he said something to me, he said, I'm saying Mr. Vice President, of course, or sir, and he's saying Lieutenant. And I'm like, and it, it, for all of you who don't have any military experience, that's not really normal. It's usually just a hey you kind of thing when you outrank somebody. So I thought that was pretty cool. And I thought that was an indicator of their personalities and who they are as men. So there were some people who, uh, outside of the media and uh, outside of politicians, who made all this happen. Uh, and they did this with elbow grease uh, and networking. It all started with a man named Don Snyder, Don J. Snyder. He lives in Scarborough, Maine. He writes books and movies and stuff and he cares deeply about our military his dad served in world war ii and uh he didn't get the chance to serve in vietnam and he regretted it his whole life but he served in other ways and so one day i read his book in the library and it was about a major who uh, and the Korean War was accused of uh, spying for China and North Korea. Uh, and Don Snyder did an investigation on him, wrote a book about him, and tried to get him exonerated for decades, and it never happened. And he still, still hasn't happened. It's something that I'm going to take up. Uh, no matter what I do, I'm going to find a way to take that, that cause up. So to Don Snyder in Scarborough, Maine, I hope you see this because I thank you. Don got all this started. He started calling people, uh, people that he had met in, I think, a wedding. And that turned out to be the world's greatest defense attorney, Colonel John Maher. Uh, Colonel Maher is, he's been here in Hunt County many times, actually. Um, you, if you if you ever saw, we don't see many BMWs around here, but uh, I don't anyway. I don't know if y'all do, but uh, Colonel Maher showed up to Hunt County, uh, and the reason why is because he wanted to meet with my mom and dad and my family in person and give them a hug and tell them that he's got my back and he's going to get me out if he can. That man worked tirelessly for five straight years. Nights, weekends, holidays, it didn't matter. Mr. Don Brown, my lead attorney, uh, strong North Carolinian. I appreciate it, everything you've done. Mr. Dick McDermott, he's one of these guys that's uh, in the background and doesn't like to be uh, in the limelight and so on and so forth. Um, and Dick was very instrumental in, in making all this happen. Pulling strings behind the curtains. Kevin Michael Leshek, Dave Bolgiano, John Carr, all part of my legal team. By the way, I've never paid a cent to any of these lawyers because I have United American Patriots that takes up that that, uh, 
I would say very easily, you know, the Colonel's not going to tell you, and he won't tell me either, but uh, I would say very easily the numbers are in the millions that these five or six, sometimes seven or eight attorneys uh, are, were owed and were, were paid by UAP uh, for what they did to get me out and, and what they do to get the other guys out. So I appreciate that. There's a, there's a woman in Michigan named Connie Powell. That's my mama's battle buddy. She kept mama going. Suzanne White is the woman in Baton Rouge, Louisiana that got all of those Cajun congressmen and the governor on board. Single-handedly, that one woman did it. I don't know how in the world she did it, but she did it. And she did it in her spare time. She works full time. I know she's not a lawyer. She's not somebody with a lot of money. She just cares. And she also knows that sometimes the squeaky wheel gets to grease. So I thank you, Suzanne. And if I had gotten out a little bit sooner, I would have been in Louisiana right now helping her get a, uh, a, a new governor elected, hopefully. Rose Lipscomb, Alabama. I thank you, Rose, for everything you did and everything you do for our troops. There are some just amazing people out there who do these amazing things for our service members. This is our team, folks. This is the dream team. Bill Carney, investigator, former NYPD, went to Afghanistan, believe this or not, went to Afghanistan and tracked down the physical DNA evidence to get me out of prison. Because that's what it took. This group of people came together to make this day happen. Years of emotional turmoil, nights, weekends, and holidays spent working on legal filings, losses, wins, ups and downs. And now we are here. We're at the finish line and it is all because of this team right here. And I'm convinced that there is nothing on this green earth that this team right here cannot accomplish. And there's nothing on this green earth that all of you cannot accomplish. From the bottom of my heart, thank you all. And finally, to all of you at home, across the world really, on the internet, may our God bless you all. And may he keep our great republic strong. Y'all stay fired up. We got work to do. I'll see you again very soon. Thank you. All right. Was that everything y'all hoped it was going to be?